Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part four of Manly P. Hall's Shakespearean Bacon Controversy. This video is taken from the All CNI, Volume 3, Number 5, December the 22nd, 1926. Cryptic title page from Famous Book. With much evidence on Shakespearean Bacon Controversy by Manly P. Hall. The title page of the most famous of all books devoted to cryptograms and enigmas is reproduced in this article. As the volume was published in 1624, only one year after the great first Shakespearean folio, it appears in the midst of the Baconian controversy. When translated, the title page reads as follows. The Cryptomancis and Cryptography of Gustavus, son of Leth. In nine books to which is added a clear explanation of the system of stenography of John Tratemius, abbot of Spenheim and Herbifilus, a man of admirable genius, interspersed with inventions of the author and others, 1624. The true author of this volume is supposed to be Augustus, Duke of Brunswick. But there is no doubt that the fine hand of the Rosicrucians was behind its publication. A proof of this can be discovered from a careful analysis of several symbols and emblems which ornament the title page. The copy from which this plate was taken belonged to King Leopold of Belgium, whose crest is on the title page. Not only do we see that this volume was connected with the Baconian controversy on account of its date of publication, but for two other reasons. First, because of the peculiar Rosicrucian and philosophical symbols upon this title page. And second, because the volume itself contains the key to both the famous biliteral cipher supposedly invented by Francis Bacon and the straight numerical cipher, which reveals the numerical equivalent to the name of Bacon as 33. Turning to page 141 on this monumental work, we find the complete key to the method of securing the numerical equivalent for the name of Bacon. Although, of course, the name of this illustrious Rosicrucian does not appear, an interesting example of this numerical method of concealing secret meanings in apparently common words, or words which at least are unintelligible, is to be found by applying the simple cipher of exchanging the letters of the alphabet for numbers to the following words seen here. A cryptic signature in Love's Labor Lost. The numerical equivalent of this word is 287, which is incidentally the number of letters appearing upon the first page of the 1623 Shakespearean folio. When the ancient name of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood was changed into a cryptic number by the process known as the K cipher, its numerical equivalent was 287. 287 and 157 are the Rosicrucian signatures in the Baconian controversy. In the Druschout portrait of Shakespeare, you will find that there are 157 letters on that page, including 29 small letters, which are the signature of the artist who cut the plate. All these things link together in an interesting and remarkable way. Information of this kind may be piled up indefinitely, but we will now present to you five other acrostic signatures extracted from various Shakespearean plays as these acrostics appear in the first folio, beginning with the seventh line of the introduction addressed to the great variety of readers. We find the following acrostic signature of Bacon. Taking the B from the third line, the A from the first line, the C from the second line, and the on from the fourth line, the acoustic signature is revealed. A large capital F at the top of the page, if included, results in the formation of F Bacon. This appears on page three of the great folio of the Shakespearean plays. The third scene of the first act of Hamlet reveals a very simple and complete acoustic. It is found in the lines as follows. The B from the third line, the A from the first line, and the con from the second line reveal the acoustic signature of Bacon. 
The last three lines of the sixth scene of the first act of Macbeth give a straight acoustic reading from the bottom upwards thus. The B from the third line, the A from the second line, and the con from the first line, again, gives us an omnipresent name, Bacon. Troilus and Cressida contains an acrostic composed entirely of capital letters as follows. This remarkable clear example can hardly be disregarded. Take the B from the third line, the A from the first, the C from the fifth, the O from the fourth, and the N from the second, and note particularly that all the letters are capital. Act 1, Scene 1, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, shows a simple Baconian acrostic, thus. We secure the letters for the name Bacon from the above lines as follows. B from the first line and from the second line and Co from the third line. By rearranging these letters, the word Bacon results. We have personally checked through nearly all the plays in the first folio and it is safe to say that there are several of these acoustics in each one of them to say nothing of the sonnets and introductory matter. While this establishes a very interesting point, it remains to establish the most forceful argument of all concerning this peculiar happening, which repeats itself too often to be a mere coincidence. In the various books actually published over the name of Sir Francis Bacon, the Bacon acrostic repeatedly occurs. A point as significant as this must receive deep and careful thought. In his preface to the 1614 edition of the Advancement and Proficiency of Learning, called Francis Lowe, Verlum, his great instauration, are found two acoustic signatures, precisely the same in their method of construction as those appearing in the Shakespearean folio in 1623. The first occurrences on page 10 of the preface, which always appear along the left-hand margin. Of course, these very evident acoustic signatures are but the simplest type of cipher used in the Baconian documents. There are many other complicated forms of acoustics which space precludes are considering. The significant lines on page 10 of the preface are as follows. This acoustic reads exactly the same as the one previously given from Macbeth. B from the third line, A from the second line, and Con from the first line. Lest this be deemed a coincidence, a four-line acoustic similar to the above appears on page 11, intentionally mispaginated. 14. Upon 16 appears another fourth-line acoustic, and upon page 20 a fourth. The latter is as follows. Find B in the second line, Na in the third line, and Ko in the first. Rearranging the letters and Bacon is produced. Now to return for a moment to the plate which accompanies this article. It is one of the most talked of title pages in connection with the Baconian controversy. The picture at the bottom shows a nobleman, presumably Bacon, placing his hat on another man's head. It may possibly be that the lights in the buildings along the shore towards which the men in the open boat are rowing in the small oval picture at the top of the place is a play upon the name Bacon, that is, Beacon. For these are, in truth, four beacon lights. The most strikingly and subtle Shakespearean point, however, is in the picture in the left side panel which shows a nobleman, probably Bacon, handing a paper to another man of mean appearance, who carries in his hand a spear. At the right, the man who previously carried the spear is shown in the costume of an actor, who spurs on and blowing a horn. The allusion to the actor blowing his horn and the figure carrying the spear suggest much, especially as spear is the last half of the name Shakespeare. 
In the next video, we will conclude this five-part series on the Bacon Shakespeare controversy. We are going to consider Shakespearean landmarks in the writings of various contemporaneous thinkers. The illustration will be the title page of the first edition of Sir Walter Raleigh's History of the World. Upon this volume are marks which indicate that it contained material of extreme Baconian importance. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating a little to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description below. Thank you very much.